It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 349 of Science on Top. Today's Sunday, the 15th of December, 2019. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. Lucas Randall. Hello. And pain specialist, Dr. Mick Vag. Welcome back. G'day. It's great to be back. Thanks, Ed. And yes, this is our last show of 2019, which means it's time to take a look back at all our favourite stories from the year. And it was a big one. We had rats driving little cars, the first photo of a black hole, and artificial intelligence doing the work of human doctors. But this year we also did something different. We actually opened it up to you, the listener, and it's been great to see all the stories that you found interesting and how similar they were to what we liked. Uh, because one of the stories I know you liked, Penny, it was also one of the highlights sent in to us from Ryan James, who's been a big fan of the show and a long-time uh, Patreon contributor. He reminded us of a story we covered in March about how the switch to agricultural societies 12,000 years ago may have changed how we talk by introducing the f and v sounds. Penny, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, this one was really cool. Um, I always... You know, I've always had an interest in archaeology and human evolution. And one of the things is that we've sort of assumed that since people became modern humans, we've been much the same. But this study suggested that the start of agriculture actually changed the way that people's jaws developed to their lifetime. So even though genetically not different, um, the actual development. So eating so we, we have an overcut and an overbite as modern humans. That means our front teeth are a bit forward mm -hmm. in front of our bottom teeth and they go a bit down over them. Um, but if you – and one of the reasons that we are able to maintain that into adulthood is because we eat, you know, a variety of soft, processed, cooked foods. And when I say soft, processed foods, I don't mean, you know, something wrapped in 12 layers of the supermarket, but more something like, you know, wheat – wheat flour. Um, however, hunter-gatherers probably had a lot more, you know, wear and tear and hard work with their jaws in, because of the diet they ate and their teeth tended to line up more. And now listeners get ready to start getting <laughs> foot and v because if you try that, line up your teeth and then try and say a f sound, it's actually a lot harder. You have to move away, move around where your mouth is. Um, so the idea is that perhaps along with the Neolithic, with the start of farming and agriculture, it also, these sounds developed and it was backed up because, well, not backed up, but, you know, supported by this, uh, survey of different languages and in societies, which were more hunter gatherer, there was, f there were also fewer f and v sounds. You're less likely to make that sound and incorporate it into language if it's a hard sound to make with the way that your jaws aligned. So I just thought that was such an interesting story, putting so many different kinds of evidence and thought mm, and ideas yes. together. I loved it. It's that thing we always talk about of that cross uh, field collaborations where yeah. someone might be a linguist, but they're working with archeologists to determine yeah. something like this, which is just awesome. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's always when they, they cross over, isn't it? So the yeah. different lines of evidence supporting a, 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 an, a hypothesis. Which is where science is going so much these days. Gone are the days where you'd just be a specialist in one thing only. Now you have to work with someone who's a specialist in something else to get that sort of crossover thing. Which is Well, I mean, that's one of the reasons I loved archaeology because you'd be working with like geologists and geomorphologists but maybe also, you know, art historians and whatever. Did you say geomorphologists? Geomorphologists. What do they do? That's exciting. Looking at the shape of the earth, so the processes that sort of shape the landscape. So there's oh, a, cool. a, kind of a kind of geologist rather than like a, a petrologist who'll study the rocks or, you know, someone who's studying the formation. <laughs> I was going to say, what the hell is a petrologist? <laughs> There's lots of different kinds. I wasn't expecting to learn anything in the final. 
There's more to geology than you think. There's more than geology than you might think. Um, but, yeah, but, you know, linguistics is often, you know, it's taught under arts faculties. It's lumped together with arts things, but to bring it into biology and have that kind of collaboration and you get these fascinating new ideas. Absolutely. And another story that Ryan really liked was about the notorious pest in Australia, the poisonous cane toad, which are a real problem because they don't really have any natural predators until some water rats just got a bit clever recently, didn't they? Yeah, so these water rats um, actually have managed to find out a way to eat cane toads. And I think a group of cane toads were found that had been attacked and, you know, it seemed like they'd been, like, disemboweled with almost surgical precision. Um, and it, they, it seems that these rats had learned how to sort of dissect the toad, um, remove the heart and liver, take away the gallbladder and pop it outside and eat the rest. So, <laughs> Sounds very Hannibal Lecter, doesn't it? Very Hannibal Lecter. Fava beans. We're, sure, we're sure that well, this I- is not aliens. We're sure this is not aliens <laughs> yeah. doing this. Yeah, because they weren't well, cows, think- Mick. They weren't cows. Okay, this, um, fair enough. <laughs> well, the authors said this discovery was intriguing enough to get them to dissect waterlogged rotting toad bodies in 40-degree heat. <sighs> That so, is intriguing. That's that intriguing. That is definitely intriguing. And the water rats were found by infrared um, cameras, so we can exclude aliens unless they happen to look like water rats. And maybe they do. Maybe they do. <laughs> <laughs> Wearing little skin suits, Doctor Who style. Driving little cars. Ah. Well, we'll we'll get to the tiny little cars later on. (laughs) But I want to move into space now. And there's one story that we've been following for quite a while now, which is the search for the hypothetical Planet Nine. And Lucas, this year we saw some more evidence that it really is out there, didn't we? We, yeah, we, we, I think we did a few stories about the, the Planet Nine, you know, theories and, and, and Mm -hmm. whatnot this, this year. But I think one of my, Favourite ones was was this uh, proposal that perhaps Planet Nine isn't a planet at all, but is actually a teeny tiny black hole, and I really like that. Um, and I think we called the episode "Teeny Tiny Black Hole." I think hole we did. Memory as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so this would be this would be a, a, a black hole formed in a different way. It wouldn't have been formed from a, a, a stellar collapse. Uh, would have been formed. Uh, it would, basically, would have been a primordial black hole, which which is really really cool. Um, just evaporating away and 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 causing the sorts of things that we were observing. That it was it was one way of explaining it. Obviously, there's no proof whatsoever. But the good thing about the the this hypothesis is it it comes with a and in order to test it, we just need to do this and this. And these are within our technological reach, which is kind of cool. So I think we'll be hearing this either confirmed or, or um, discounted pretty soon. Well, let's hope so. But when you say a primordial black hole, we're talking like from the birth of the solar system, the universe, the galaxy? Universe. So, wow. so very, very, yeah, basically uh, this is, this is a, an old one um, because there's, there's, we've got a few different black holes that we we're aware of. We've got obviously the, the, the stellar um, mass black holes, which tend to be sort of, you know, a, a very specific range of masses uh, beyond the mass of our sun, because our sun's not big enough to get there. Our star's not big enough to get there. Uh, but then of course, we've got super massive black holes, which are the ones that tend to be, or that we, we observe in the centers of, of galaxies. And we think are probably the, in the middle of all galaxies. We've also done uh, some stories recently about some some other black holes, which are kind of up around the 70 solar masses, mm. which is way bigger than a, a stellar mass black hole, but way, way smaller than a, than a supermassive black hole. And they, if you recall from those stories, um, it's presumed that they probably form in a very specific way, which is also really cool. Go back to the story. I don't want to get into the <laughs> details of it now. But yeah, this, these primordial black holes are uh, potentially much, much smaller mass. And of course, you know, over time, they just slowly evaporate away. But that takes a very, very long time, much longer than the universe has been around. So they would still be around all these little primordial black holes. Yeah. So it could be one of those. And if it doesn't have the mass 
like if it doesn't have mass that's that's um, similar to our star, um, it would pretty much act like a planet as far as, you know, it's just another gravitational body. So if it were in orbit, in some kind of weird orbit around our star because it was captured or maybe even our star formed as a binary sort of companion to this thing, then it could be interacting in ways that we're, that we're seeing. Yeah. Uh, but it would be also emitting cosmic ray, like X-rays. So we, we should be able to find it, which is also pretty cool. But That's very cool. I'm still kind of shocked that there can be a tiny black hole like that and so close to us in our solar system. Teeny tiny <laughs> black holes. The thing I love about this is that this is, as a casual astronomy lover, this is the sort of stuff you live for because... You know, we thought we had it all worked out and, it, it, and you know, they've been using gravitational calculations to predict the, um, you know, presence of planets. They had a huge success with um, discovering Uranus and then Neptune. Yeah. And then the problem yeah. was, the problem was that uh, Pluto did not explain what they were seeing with Neptune mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they've kept looking. And, uh, you know, the, the guys that are proposing these hypotheses are not mugs. You know, Mike Brown and these guys, they're, they're really serious scientists. And and you just feel like it's tantalising, you know, what, what is going to come of this? And it's one of the genuine scientific mysteries of our time in astronomy, which I, I just love it. Yeah, I totally agree. The, fa the, the fact that they're, they're proposing these explanations is because there's something that we're observing which doesn't fit in with, with what we understand as the orbital mechanics of our solar system. It just doesn't work unless there's something else out there. Um, and, yeah, as you say, that's so cool. And, and the more we learn, the more questions there are. <laughs> which is which is what keeps me, what keeps me turning up each day. <laughs> yeah. That's characteristic <laughs> of the best science. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but it's also it's a great uh, segue of that story into what I think is probably one of the biggest stories of the year in more ways than one, which was the first ever photo of a black hole, or I should say the accretion disk around a black hole. And I love this purely because of the massive global collaboration that went into it. Uh, this was from radio telescopes located in Chile, Mexico, Spain, Hawaii, Arizona, and the Antarctic, which formed the Event Horizon Telescope, or EHT. And they were studying this black hole in the centre of the galaxy known as M87, which is 55 million light years away, as well as the black hole in the centre of the Milky Way. And they did this really cool thing. Researchers from all of those telescopes split up into four groups and worked independently. They didn't share any information or any data between each other. And then they regrouped, compared each other's images, and found that they were strikingly similar, which I think is so awesome. That's like the ultimate validation of your data when you get four groups working separately and get the same result. And didn't they use different different um, techniques to some degree as well from memory? Uh, I'm not sure. They might have done, um, particularly as you say, you know, those all those different telescopes. They're going to be slightly different methods mm. that those telescopes are going to use. But then, of course, you've got to combine all of that to get the one single picture using all of that data, which was another challenge because we simply don't have a fast enough internet for that sort of thing. We're talking five petabytes of data so if you think of most average laptops these days will have a one terabyte hard drive of space sort of thing we're talking five thousand hard drives worth of data so they transported that data the old-fashioned way all the hard drives on planes flown to a oh harvard God. university lab <laughs> because there's no other way to get that sort of information to the one spot where supercomputers can crunch on it and so that's how we got the first ever photograph image of the accretion disk of a black hole or the eye of Sauron. Depends what you want to call it. <laughs> but I just think that sort of collaboration is awesome. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I remember when you – I wasn't on that episode. I think you had um, uh, you had a guest on for that episode. Uh, uh, yeah, I think we had uh, Kirsten Banks on for that. Kirsten Banks, yes, Kirsten Banks did that one, and I and I remember when when you shared that episode in the show notes, there was a uh, a link to an XKCD, <laughs> um, you know, comic showing the the you know this accretion disk overlaid, uh, well, overlaid, underlaid almost behind an, uh, a, a two scale drawing of our solar system, 
and and the entire event horizon was larger than our solar system, right, right out to Pluto. It was just mind boggling. It's a huge uh, black hole, six point five billion times the mass of the sun. So <laughs> that's a lot. Billion. That's decent. <laughs> decent. And I think it it's it's not particularly active, but it does swallow one solar mass, the mass the times of our sun worth of matter every 10 years. So <laughs> it's when you start getting numbers like that, my mind just goes, no, nah, I give up. I can't imagine it. It's too big. Yeah. This is when you need things like those comparisons yeah. you know, so that we can try and see how many that. elephants it, I mean, in that black it, hole. That's what I want. I was going to say many- <laughs> Olympic <laughs> swimming pools. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Unless, uh, yeah, unless we're talking about icebergs and then it's usually uh, like, uh, Luxembourg uh, or something. Uh, Wales or Luxembourg or something. That's the reference size. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think there was, there was one final space story that, uh, some of our listeners emailed us about and it, also speaks to another recurring theme that we have on the show, which is about NASA keep on trying to get things to not give up and never never tiring to try and get something to work. I'm talking about the up and down history of the mole, a drill on the InSight Mars lander that's been trying to dig down through the Martian soil and rock since March this year. It's not quite going to plan, is it? it, it I... I... No, it's not. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> to answer your question, no, it isn't. Thanks. But, don't leave but, me hanging. Wow, what a journey. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of your hand was up in the air there. It's like, don't leave. Yeah. Um, yeah, this this has been interesting to follow. And I know I was pretty flippant about the InSight mission because it's really easy to kind of anthropomorphize the rovers mm-hmm. because they move. Yeah. You know, they move around and, and it's kind of – you know, and they, they have Twitter accounts and they're kind of made cute and um, and they, they move around discovering things. This thing just sits there. Um, <laughs> but it does have it does have moving bits and, and one of the bits of course is this mole, which is this this kind of um, it, it it's it's not a drill as such. It's more of a probe that they're kind of just ramming into the ground. Um, and and as a result of it being rammed into the ground um, they obviously did a whole lot of testing and stuff back on Earth when they were designing the thing, but there were, they, they, there's really quite a lot of luck involved in this situation because they they chose a landing site that they felt would be appropriate type of 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 soil for this thing to to be able to ram its way into, but but a rock would be enough to stop it. Um, and, and, and soil that's too soft would also stop it because it relies on a certain amount of friction um, between it and the, the sides of the sort of hole that it's making. So over time, you know, they, they, they found that it only got, you know, I think it was like 20 centimetres or something into the ground and it stopped. I may be completely wrong about the measurement, but I know it wasn't much. I think it was 18 to 20, something like that. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, so they, they then sort of pull – they, they pulled it back up, but they had to be really careful with it because the tether that's on it's not really designed to pull it out of the ground. And then they decided, okay, let's actually try and provide a little bit more um, friction for this thing by pushing on it with the robotic um, arm or some sort of robotic part of the, the, the probe that can kind of push down on the ground to give it a little bit more. So they managed to get it moving again and... This has, the thing that I love about this is it just epitomizes the problem-solving spirit of engineers involved in anything to do with space mm-hmm. because, they're, you know, they're, they're faced with challenges unlike pretty much everything else. And there's not much other than deep sea, um, you know, challenges that, that are equivalent because you, you're dealing with things that are a long way away. You simply cannot go there. You can't use humans to fix the problem. You've only got what you've got. And you've, you, you're constrained by certain power, you know, constraints. You've also got issues with there's no tools, there's no undoing things, you know, all of the, the problems that they have. Visibility might be low. Right. And, of course, <clears throat> you've got you've to create analogs for this stuff and try and, you know, replicate what you're, what you're experiencing remotely to, to problem solve locally and then implement a solution you know, remotely. It's just – it's I love it. Uh, it's It's – it really the the engineering um, troubleshooting is is just really something quite marvelous, I think. Uh, and and that that this event and what they did with it actually 
drew my attention to Insight when I, I was a little bit ambivalent towards this uh, this particular lander before. Um, so yeah, that was why that caught my eye. Well done, engineers. Yeah, I think. Hurrah! Well, yeah, let's have a toast to engineers. And you might want to do that with some wine. And Mick, do you want to tell us about one of your favourite stories, which is all about the medieval grape that is still being used to make wine? Indeed. So this was this was one where DNA profiling of, of wine grapes is actually a pretty new science. It's really only uh, since about 1993 that they've actually been able to DNA profile um, wine grapes. And a lot of it prior to that was was just guessing and uh, if you go around some parts of victoria particularly central victoria parts of victoria where there are still grapes that were brought out before phylloxera came through in the 1870s and 1880s and wrecked everything yeah he was a uh, but there are there are there, there, <laughs> follow, it was I don't know what you're talking there about. Was, yeah, phylloxera, phylloxera was a, uh, a pest, uh, like a, an aphid that ate the uh, roots of the wine grapes. And it was responsible for destroying um, all the wine grapes around Geelong and the southern part of Victoria, which uh, before 1870 or thereabouts was actually the largest wine producing area in Australia. And it took over 100 years before they planted wine grapes here again. Um, but I, di- I digress. So there are still some vineyards in central Victoria where there are wine grapes that go back over 150 years and nobody actually knows what they are and they've um, they were brought out from France and trying to work out exactly what is what with wine grapes turns out to be very difficult and uh, what the story that that we were talking about was um, from a, an archaeological site where they found 900 year old wine seeds or wine grape seeds and they DNA uh, analysed those and found out that they are absolutely identical to a modern day variety called Sauvignon, as in not Sauvignon. Uh, that's that's your classic Savvy Blanc that we all enjoy. Um, but Savignon was is actually a slightly different uh, variety, which these days grows in Spain under the name Albariño, and which has actually been imported to Australia under that name. But but this is like the uh, the Johnny Appleseed or the the grandfather of a lot of varieties including Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris and and a lot of other modern grapes but the really fascinating thing was that these 900 year old seeds showed that that cultivar that that um, genetic line has continued completely unchanged for nearly a thousand years and uh, so there are there are quite possibly some grapes which are, are being grown and drunk even in this part of Australia where I am down in southern Victoria um, there are there are quite possibly some direct descendants there of, of vines that have been continuously cultivated with no genetic variation for you know over a millennium which is really really cool which is a tribute That's really cool. to the care that those wine growers have obviously taken over generations and over the last night absolutely years. because you just I can't help but assume that there'd be some sort of genetic mutation or some cross pollination or something that would have happened to change it over 900 years but and and sometimes there are actually um you know hybrids or or um you know some variability where a a particular cultivar grows naturally better in some spots than others and uh the classic example of that is burgundy where there are there are many different clones of the pinot noir grape which are subtly different to each other um but which will grow better in certain conditions such as a bit more sunlight or a bit moister soil and uh, in fact the really the really really clever oenologists around um Burgundy will will be able to look at the climatic and soil conditions in any given vineyard plot and tell you which particular clone of a particular grape you should plant there for the best results. Um, so so all of this is only really it's it's new science. It's only as I say the the DNA um, technology to identify and, and subtype a lot of these things has only been around since 1993. Prior to that, believe it or not, they did it by analysing the shapes of the leaves on the grapevines, ah. and that was uh, that was that was a science called ampelography. We are learning so many new ologies and ographies today. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine uh, now that they've they've sort of started to dial in on these techniques, Mick, we probably probably give it another few years and we'll have an app 
uh, <laughs> that will have an app mm. for that. You know, you, you stick your little probe thing, you know, that's that's tethered via Bluetooth to your phone and it will go, oh, you should plant this particular grape here. Well, well, actually, t- certainly around the Geelong region, there's actually a guy who does a, <laughs> a guy's name. There's always Gary. a guy. Yeah, this, this guy's name's Gary Farr, and he uh, he originally planted the Bannockburn Vineyard, and he's he's responsible for planting something like fifty percent of all the Pinot Noir uh, on on either side of the bay in Melbourne. Uh, he was a, a vineyard consultant, and uh, he's he's actually the guy that knows. You know, give him the soil, uh, give him a photo of the vineyard, and how it looks at sort of morning, noon, and evening, um, and he'll uh, he'll pop over with the right grapes. Ah, so maybe the app should be called Gary. <laughs> but but the, but the but the best thing is though there will never be we'll never run out of ways to bore people when talking about wine. That's the best <laughs> thing about. It. I'll be honest. I tend to judge a wine by its price and its alcohol content. So <laughs> <laughs> and flavour, I'll admit. Uh, well. Penny, I wanted, I know that you were a big fan of the time when scientists painted cows to look like zebras. <laughs> <laughs> was it purely because they painted cows to look like zebras or was there more to the story than that? I think it was... It was I think you broke Penny. Of, I did, yeah. Because of the you sprung that on her. You the sprung dog. that on her. The picture of the cow. Painted like a zebra, but then like there's a, a dotted line box highlighting the body, the leg, and then like some little circles where the flies were biting. <laughs> it's the simple things. Yeah. It's, it's the diagram. Yeah. No, no diagrams make it sciencey, so that's that's the main thing. You've got to have a diagram, maybe a graph like or something. Some, like diagram I would make. Well, like that Spike Milligan would make, like, you know, front of the cow, back of the cow. Anyway, I'm not mocking the science. Like, as we found, it is a really environmentally friendly way to, like, not get flies bitten, cows bitten by um, flies. It could be that in 50 years we we laugh. Imagine the thought of a field, what are they called? Not a horde of cows, um, a herd of herd? cows that are not painted herd. like... <laughs> The rampaging <laughs> hordes of cows. Like oh. rampaging, thundering majestically across the plain. <laughs> Genghis cow. Yeah, if we see one of them that's not kind of like this. Did you just say Genghis cow? <laughs> yeah. It's a horde. Uh, wow. <laughs> we are really in the silly season I now, aren't we? <laughs> I can't talk. We can come this back to the cows if science. you want. <laughs> it was beautiful science. If you paint a cow like a zebra, it doesn't get bitten by flies as much. Props to the people who found <laughs> Let's leave that one there and cut. <laughs> We're done. We're done. There's nothing here. <laughs> right. Well, I think that oh, covers the, uh, the cows <laughs> that painted like zebras. <laughs> I think the actual the lead with that one. The sci- <laughs> no, we'd not get anything else done. I think the actual the theory behind that was that it was polarized light that it would be reflecting that uh, the flies don't like as much or they uh, steer away from polarized light, so that vertical stripes sort of thing. But it was very very fun. There. Yeah. The landing, so, so the landing sensors, or something. But we, we've done. I remember we, and when we did this story, we also talked about the fact we had previously done a story at some point over the last nine years or so about uh, zebras and how they were, they were basically immune or relatively immune compared to non-stripy horses. Yeah. horses yes. <laughs> non-stripy horses uh, from from uh, from it was like tsetse fly. I think it was was the the yep. issue. March there. flies. Yeah. Yep. But that story does actually remind me of one of your favourites, Lucas, which was when researchers taught rats to drive tiny electric cars and crash into walls. Oh, this was <laughs> – that was so cool. And I think that, that again, and I, I just want to reiterate that the, the one disappointment I have with that story is although there was video included with this, this coverage, there was video that was that – was, they captured of these – these rats driving the cars. I really wanted to see a close-up so I could see the face 
of the rat and its little hands as it steered <laughs> <laughs> this car. I wanted to see, was it kind of peering over in that kind of way of concentrating on where it's going? Because looking at the videos that were shot sort of, you know, right back, you could see these things steering these cars towards the um, the trigger thing that they had to hit in order to, to release the reward. But they hit with a great deal of velocity. There was no messing around. <laughs> That's like, I've got to hit that and I will hit that hard. Um, but, yeah, I really wish I could have seen their faces. I should be clear. I don't think they were actually trained to drive into walls. That was just how they drive. But that was just, that's how they drive. I mean, they're not, yeah. And now they're now that's what they're known for. Uh, rats are not good drivers. I mean, they can hit the mark, but they hit it hard. I have to say, though, do, do, do you think, though, that they're just anthropomorphizing a little bit with this? No. Movie? Because in the, you know, they're saying that the rats had higher levels of dehydroepiandosterone, which they believe were linked to the satisfaction of having learned a new skill. That might that be a bit be. of a reach. You could be under something. The rats are saying, actually, this is going to be great for my CV. I can drive. <laughs> yeah. Proficient in crashing cars. <laughs> uh, yeah. Would that not have been um, uh, potentially also linked to their satisfaction at getting the reward, the actual reward, the food reward? I think probably I more towards, to do with that, I would say. No, it's all about the skill acquisition. <laughs> yeah, oh, of course. So they found that an increase in that, and uh, which is a satisfaction uh, hormone, but they also found a, a re- lesser amount of stress hormone as well as an anti-stress hormone. So it wasn't just that they're learning new things, making them excited. They're actually more relaxed and calmer and happier behind the wheel, I guess. So I get that. I like driving. Yeah, I just don't just like put, slamming just, into walls. Just put them in peak hour and see how they go. Mm. <laughs> well, then you're not driving, then you're parked. So, Yeah, true. Well, I mentioned at the start about artificial intelligence doing the work of human doctors. And there was a, were actually a number of stories about AI this year. One yeah. I know you particularly liked, Lucas, was an Australian story about an AI that developed a flu vaccine, which is pretty cool. Yeah, this, this came out of um, uh, some work done at uh, Flinders University where these researchers had um, developed this AI that basically its task, or there were two parts of it. The first part of it was, was something they called SAM, which its task was to basically um, synthesize every possible combination uh, of different ingredients, if you like, of vaccine. So it was called the search algorithm for ligands. And so it it basically just just searched for all conceivable compounds um, to find drugs. And then there was a second AI program um, that that then would test these compounds for their ability to interact in certain ways. Um, So the key with this really was the speed at which AI can work is far beyond what we can actually do with people and in a lab with actual actual chemicals, but also the ability for it to start to weed out things that that wouldn't interact in any meaningful way very, very quickly, and then use what it learns to speed up the way it then rules out future ones. So it gets faster and faster at doing the task. And basically, it was able to just rip through tens of thousands of potential vaccines very, very quickly and go, no, 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 that one's interesting, no, 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 no. Uh, and that's just, you know, I think this is one of one of an increasing number of examples we're going to see over the next few years, particularly because AR is really just being used all over the place now. And we're going to see more and more of this sort of thing where they go, we've just got a mass task that needs doing and let's not train the eye, well, let's not program a, a software to, to do a, a thing in a specific way. We just train an AI about the outcomes we need and what we know and let it figure it out. And they start slow and then they just ramp up and get ridiculously fast. Yeah. And take over the world. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. So as a as a human doctor, I just feel personally attacked by this bit. So <laughs> so I would I would actually like the AI gets given the glamorous jobs like, you know, curing flu and all this sort of stuff. So I would I will be convinced that it's good. 
when you can get AI to help people quit smoking, exercise more, or write hospital discharge summaries, then we will be getting somewhere with how useful this is. I reckon the discharge summaries is, is very doable. I think that is just around the corner. The It'll certainly be more legible than when a doctor writes it. <laughs> I think the other things that you listed, I don't think we're ever going to find a way to get those things done. Mm. Even by human doctors. Well, we're giving it a go. We should also point out that we haven't actually had a AI-developed vaccine administered to a human patient or anything like this. This was more of a proof of concept, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. I think they're looking for get funding for a uh, clinical trial. But there are, I mean, there are there are AI networks that can actually, uh, you know, improve diagnosis and and help with decision making. By, by basically playing the odds, which is, which is you know, what an experienced um, doctor does is they, they look at the totality of the clinical information and then uh, decide out of all this, you know, massive competing interests, you know, what's the, what's the quickest, easiest way through it. And, uh, and so there is, there is some promise with AI for decision support tools um, in all seriousness. Yeah. And, 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 and tell me, Mick, how, how accurate was... Dr. Gregory House's team portrayal of how they did that on the show. I'm, I'm assuming very not. <laughs> uh, no. Nah. It's, it, it's, it's fair to say that, uh, that Dr. Gregory House, someone who doesn't even use their, you know, walking hand on the, right the side. correct hand, <laughs> as a, again, as a rehab physician, I can't watch that show. Everything he says is rubbish. If you just use it in, use it in the right hand, mate. Use it in the right hand. You'll, yeah. you'll, walk, you'll walk much more evenly. You'll, your weight he transfer felt- will be better. Your, your energy yes. expenditure per unit distance is much more efficient if you just use your damn cane properly. He, he, he took it as a creative decision that it was a better portrayal that way. Next, next, you'll be telling me sometimes it really is lupus. <laughs> it was lupus once. It I remember once. once in that show, right. it was lupus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was the joke that, like, five seasons building mm. up to that joke. Mm. <laughs> now, if you want a, if you if you want a good medical show, just watch Scrubs. Don't watch it. Nah. <laughs> I love Scrubs. That's such a great show. Green Wing for me. It's the ultimate. Actually, that, oh, that Green was Wing too. was very good. Oh, but Green Wing and Scrubs is probably the two shows that feel the most like working in a hospital, I can tell you that. Really? That is really, oh, really depressing <laughs> to know. That's terrifying. No, that's <laughs> awesome to know. What do you mean depressing? <laughs> Bit of both. But while we're talking medical stories, uh, Mick, I know that you're a big fan of the story about the woman who could smell when someone had Parkinson's, and which was how we found that, Lucas, you're a very limited super smeller. Yes, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lame super smeller. The thing that's interesting about that particular story is that it actually, there, there's a whole huge genre of research in um, this sort of micro particle detection uh, of of um, uh, otherwise preclinical illness and uh, the thing that struck a chord with me about that particular story is that um, there are actually um, there's research going on actually in Adelaide in Australia where we're looking at biomarkers for pain based on junk RNA little, little micro RNA that comes out in people's urine so so we're actually not a million miles away from having a urine test that can roughly test how much pain someone's in based on the transcription junk RNA that gets extruded. That is so cool. Yeah, so there's this stories like that. So this particular lady seemed to have the ability to detect a particular biomarker um, that, that that was present in the sebum of people's skin. So, so people with uh, preclinical Parkinson's disease before it actually manifested in the shaking and the, you know, impaired movement and so forth, that the that there appears to be some sort of biomarker that's secreted in their sebum that this particular lady had a sensitive enough nose to recognise, and 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 this is there's you know there's going to be a lot more of this sort of thing where we're looking for these these tiny little highly accurate highly specific biomarkers that require sort of micro level detection that will move the the diagnosis of some of these conditions um, you know way way earlier. It's really it's really interesting. We link it also to some other previous stories we've done about um, canines uh, detecting certain 
cancers, I think, from memory. Mm, mm, mm. Um, which I think I, I think the jury was out on whether they actually could or not. I don't think it had been. Yeah, I believe. Shown. I believe. I think that was a cat in a nursing home in the UK. Um, and, okay. uh, and, and, and I, yeah, I, I think there was a bit of, cause I actually did look into that one and I think there was a little bit of, um, doubt about that one. Hmm. Uh, right. Some but, controversy. Uh, the lack of controlled conditions was, was a bit of the, the, the cat was never actually put in an RCT condition and blinded as to, as to how it would do it. But, um, but you know, th- that's how you, you strike an interesting hypothesis like that and, and that's how you test it. So. Um, also, you know, anecdotes are anecdotes are really useful for hypothesis generation. Sure, but I yes. mean, put a cat in a nursing home, you're probably going to find people with cancer. There's a fairly yeah, yeah. high percentage of people in nursing homes who have some form of cancer. But- exactly. Yeah, and, and and look, someone someone who the cat sits on is going to be diagnosed with a serious health problem not long after, just based on mm. statistical things. Mm. So you know, it's 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 so clearly the cat's causing these diseases. Well, certainly the staff are noticing the staff are noticing the ones they're noticing the hits and not the misses. Yeah, so it's confirmation by yeah, very human part of it. The yeah. cat's a witch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's the our cat, witch. the cat must be the familiar of a witch. Uh, right, they had, they had <laughs> to find which staff member was the witch. <laughs> right, I think that's pretty much. all. Oh, there was one more uh, story I think that you liked, Penny, which was all about uh, the Kilauea caldera. Where they found a lake that had grown, that had appeared in this uh, caldera, hadn't they? Yeah, I really like that, and I think it's just I also like like I like a good geology story, but you know they don't necessarily always have broad appeal. So this was fun. So it was it was cool to actually see that lake forming after um, you know over time. So. You know, and to be reminded how hard it is just to sometimes observe things that are going on with volcanoes. Like, you know, drones couldn't do it um, with the air currents, cultural considerations, park regulations and so on. So they had to wait for a helicopter to go and look at it and see that there were reflections to show that it was water and not just some, you know, weird fungus or something. Yeah. yeah. So that was pretty cool. I liked, I liked seeing that. Yeah, it's just one of those weird things where also it was unexpected. It was this was a lake yeah. bed that had drained, and then water appeared, and it hadn't rained, so obviously it had come from underground somewhere, but mm. we weren't sure where or how. It just goes to show that there's always new stuff happening, even when you don't think there is. Yes, which is a nice note I think to end the show on. We will of course have all the links to those stories on the web at scienceontop.com/slash three four nine. I want to say a big thank you to everyone who sent in your favourite stories of the year, everyone who left feedback over the year, either on social media or by email or the contact form on our website. Uh, And especially a big thank you to all our Patreon supporters. Without your help, we would not have been able to keep the show going this year. So we're very, very grateful for that. We will be taking a break over January, but we'll return in February. In the meantime, of course... We'll have our bloopers episode, so keep an eye on scienceontop.com for that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> a lot of it I will be coming from today. To, I always <laughs> look forward to that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you for joining me today, Penny, Lucas, and Mick. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Never less than a pleasure. Dr. Mick Vag, where can people go to find you on the internet? Is there anything you want to plug or...? Uh, there's, there, there's nothing I want to plug apart from get your flu vax and be a Patreon supporter of this show. <laughs> oh, I get behind both of those messages. Very well said. Well, thank you everyone for listening. I hope your 2020 is full of good health, good cheer and great science. We'll be back in February putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Mm-hmm.